Hello! Today we are going to have a look at the Black Square Analog Grand Caravan in Microsoft Flight Simulator. Somebody actually asked me to do this video to go back over it because they'd bought it and they couldn't find any good materials online that kind of went through how everything works in the cockpit. So that's what we're going to do today and in order to do that we've picked an airfield in France called aix les which is on the edge of the Alps. Uh, we're going to just go for a fly. The reason we've picked here is because there is an ILS. There is also a VOR nearby, so we can play games with flying towards the VOR. And obviously the scenery is very nice around here as well. So if we have a look around, you can see some lovely valleys. And it's actually a really nicely modelled airport as well. Okay, so let's go and jump inside the aircraft. So this is the uh, the analog caravan, the 208 from Black Square. It's not very expensive and it gives you essentially a study level Grand Caravan. So, you know, lots of the breakers work now, a lot of the switches work. Um, obviously it's got analog gauges and they all work as well and it's all really nicely modelled. So let's go through the startup procedure. First thing we do in a Grand Caravan is go and turn the fuel pumps to on. We're going to be staying at low altitude today so we don't have to worry about oxygen at all. Okay, fuel is on. Next thing we do is go and turn the battery to on on this side pedestal. So this is our main switch panel for power, basically. So battery goes to on, and in the background you will hear some sounds. That's the fan coming on behind the scenes. Let's just check the volume levels. See if you can hear the same things I'm hearing, which I think you can. There's an enunciator panel overhead that shows you any things that are you know you need to know about. Obviously it's lit up at the moment because the engine isn't running. So let's get this engine running so we can at least see how it works. So fuel boost goes to norm. Before remembering there's going to be people on the ground, so the lights we put the lav light on, we also go and put the beacon light on, meaning we're going to switch the engine on next. So fuel boost goes to norm and then to on. Having turned the electric on you can see the voltage here by the way and up here you will start to see the gauges moving around. So we can then hit start on the engine and we can move the mixture to low idle. I, th I think I could do that, yeah I could do that on the stick as well. I'm just checking that my um, throttle and everything are in the correct place. We'll move the RPM up to max as well. So the fuel boost can come off now and go back to norm. Starter can go to off because the engine has actually started. And you can see now it's just got a generator off. So all we need to do is reset the generator and that gets rid of that. Okay at this point we can go and turn the avionics on. The reason you do the avionics after the engine is the engine starting up can actually cause surges on the electrical subsystems. So you can see things correcting themselves down here. There we go. So we now have the HSI is working or the horizontal situation indicator. Um, this is interesting actually, this is a combined gauge. The horizontal situation indicator is kind of the whole thing. The bit in the middle with the needle is called the CDI or course deviation indicator. Okay, so we got a message showing up on the uh, the system over here. So we've pressed message. You will see, and there's actually nothing to see. I think what this actually relates to is we've behind the scenes we've got the GTN 750, but I'm going to show you that in a moment. We'll have a quick look at the Garmin, and then we'll switch it out. It's kind of the party piece of this aeroplane that you can switch out pieces of the panel. It's worth also noting in the 208. There's this um, non-functional radar over here. If we roll it round to nav, suddenly you can see what this is really for in this aircraft. It's got uh, an engine condition and damage simulation part to it. So you can set failure rates. So you can have things like wear and tear on the aircraft can actually cause problems for you. So we're, we're just sitting here at tick over at the moment, not a problem. Okay, so if we're gonna go and fly, we will need the strobes on. We'll do it before we get to the runway. Normally you wouldn't do that until you get to the runway. Put the seatbelt signs on inside, the anti-smoking signs inside, or non-smoking. Uh, Pito Heat can 
come on. You can see the lever here is the parking brake. If we release it, I don't think we have any positive thrust. Let's just try that. So if I release the parking brake, do we begin rolling? No, we don't. So you don't get enough positive thrust at tick over or at idle for it to start rolling, which is good. Okay. So we can move the mixture forwards. Oh, it's, it's not really mixture in a turboprop, it's engine condition. So you're basically supplying fuel to the engine. So it's really a configuration of the engine rather than a mixture. Um, okay, so let's have a look at some of the dials we've got here. We've got indicated airspeed. So obviously that's telling you how fast you're going and it measures that by reading a, a sensor. I can't remember where it is on this aircraft. There it is. So you see that spike on the front of the wing? That's reading the air pressure that the aeroplane is flying into and that air pressure gives you your indicated airspeed. Notice if you're flying into a headwind, therefore, it's not going to be the same as your speed over the ground. So you can obviously get that from the GPS. Um, you've got attitude indicator. That tells you which way up you are, surprisingly enough. You've got altimeter. Now the altimeter can be um, calibrated to the local air pressure. Again, it uses the pitot tube to measure the altitude, the altitude we are above sea level. So a quick shortcut, you can turn the knob here, which you can see is changing the um, the barometric pressure, which is therefore changing the altitude. Altitude. I can't talk today. So if we press B on the keyboard, it shortcuts that and tells us it to the local air pressure of this airfield. Over here, we've got the distance measuring equipment. So if we were to tune in the nav radio to the VOR that's nearby, that will light up with a distance. We've got down here um, the the nav radio indicators. So that's just basically showing us the, the direction of the tuned in radio. We'll see that in a moment. And again, we mentioned this earlier, this is the combined HSI and um, course deviation indicator. So horizontal situation indicator and course deviation indicator. There's two parts to this. So you can, there's a heading bug on the outside. So if you're using heading mode on the autopilot, it will follow that, but you can use it as well, just as a visual reference. You've also got your course, so you can point that. That really comes into play when you're using nav radios. Uh, sorry, VOR radios, I should say. Uh, you've got vertical speed measured in hundreds of feet per minute. You've got the VOR2, or NAV2 radio, sorry. Uh, so two radios correspond with two radio frequencies that you can have tuned in. So we've got two different radios here. Uh, nav2 is tuned in down here, nav1 up here. T it's worth pointing out, look, if we roll the knobs for the frequency, we're changing the comm radio. You have to push the knob and it flicks the focus over between the comm or communication radios and the navigation radios. So just to illustrate that, let's go and look up. So this um, VOR out here, the Chambry 8 Clébin, is CBY, Charlie Bravo Yankee, and the frequency for it was 115.40. So if we roll around the outer ring on here, gives us the integers, and to do the, in the uh, decimals, it's the inner ring of the knob. So uh, notice we are there are two frequencies here. There's a standby frequency and an active frequency, and you can press the button here to swap them. So this means you can be using one frequency and preparing the next. So if we flick that over, you'll see this come to life. So the way the HSI works is if you turn the course, you can see the needle move. So when the course deviation indicator or the line is in the middle, that means you're going straight towards the VOR. Yeah, so it's at 340 degrees from us. And if we were to measure that on the map, measure distance, so we can see 340 degrees. Yeah. Okay, if we, it's a, a, an important thing about this is you can see that white arrow underneath. If we were to spin this all the way round, it goes to the opposite side than the yellow arrow which means that's the direction from us. So if we were going 160 degrees, we would be traveling directly away from 
the uh, the VOR station. So if we measure from the VOR station on the map, and there we go, 160 degrees from. So if we were travelling from it, we would be going that way. Okay, so we're going to spin it back round, so it's going to tell us exactly the direction to the VOR. So remembering when it lines up, that's directly towards it. We'll get more into this when we're actually flying. Uh, we've got a course uh, turn coordinator down here. So this tells you if the aircraft is travelling in a straight line, basically, if the tail is following the nose, which it may not if you're in a crosswind, for example. And it helps you um, coordinate turns, so the, the most efficient way to make a turn in an aircraft is to make sure the tail is behind the nose on the way around the corner. If you only use the ailerons to turn, uh, you end up with the plane skidding around the corner. So that it tends to the tail might fall in, or you know, to the inside or outside of the turn, depending on bank angle. Okay, so let's go and have a look at how we might program a route. So let's just go and switch this back off, so we hide the secret menu in it. Um, let's go and program and say we're going to fly out to that VOR. So to program a route on the 530, I'm going to show you both. The 530, the, the Garmin that's built into the simulator, and an add-on called the GTN 750, which is a huge upgrade to it. So if we go to the flight plan page, the way you program routes on this, I'm just going to look up our airport code before we do this, LFLB we are at. So the way you program routes is you go to the flight plan page, which you can see I've just clicked there, and you push the knob in at the bottom right, and it puts a focus on the waypoint. So now the inner ring will change letters and the outer ring, ring will move the cursor along the field once we're typing something. So the inner ring, we're going to go to LFLB. So we roll it and it starts trying to key something in. So we keep rolling it. So we can go to L. Then the next character by using the outer ring. F. next character L and B so obviously it confirms the name of the airport so you then press enter and that makes that the waypoint to go to the next waypoint you use the outer ring you just roll the mouse on it and we use the inner ring to start keying it in so we need to know the identity of the VOR which is CBY so we start rolling the inner ring. We want to go backwards through the alphabet to C, then B, and then Y. So we can go backwards. There we go, Chambéry et Clébin. So enter, or Chambéry. Now there's two things called this within the database of the system. So there's a VOR and another waypoint. So we'll choose the VOR. So there we go. So 15 nautical miles away is CBY. Okay, that's all we're going to do for our flight plan for the moment. So we'll press flight plan. And now if we were to zoom out or make the range bigger, you can see the line across the map now from us over to the VOR. Okay, so we're not going to worry too much about that. The only other thing we need to know about is the CDI button. So at the moment, this is operating in VLOC mode. What that means is the navigation equipment is going to follow the tuned-in radio beacons. Yeah, which is why we could we could see the needles moving around. Yeah, if we press the CDI button, it will switch over to using GPS mode. So I'm going to press it. It's gone to GPS mode. Notice this has centered itself up. So suddenly the course doesn't mean anything anymore. So in terms of us actually using this to navigate, it's useless. We have to navigate by looking at the map now. Yeah. If we go back to VLOC mode, suddenly this is representing the navigation radios again, not the GPS. Yeah, so this essentially becomes useless when you are using the GPS. Okay, 
so we are going to be using navigation radios. We're going to leave it in VLOC mode because I think it's a lot more interesting. So we're still sat here burning fuel on the, the taxiway. Let's go. We've still got the parking brake on. We're going to move the flaps to take off position, which you can see I've just done here. And let's go and get in the air so we can put the yoke back on. I'm just checking the lights. We don't need... Or we'll probably do need landing lights. There's um, a bit of a discussion about this. For aircraft that are commercial aircraft are supposed to keep their landing lights on below 10,000 feet. But where the line is between it being a general aviation aeroplane and a commercial aircraft is a good question. And operators might have different rules on this themselves. So I've just released the parking brake, increasing the throttle. And we're going to taxi out to the runway. following the taxiway around this way. So just before we get onto the runway, I'm going to switch that radio kit over and show you the old Turner, which is the GTN 750, because it's very very good. So we're going to hold short of the runway here, put the parking brake back on. Oh did I, I forgot to mention look as soon as we switched on the VOR or tuned in the VOR beacon it's telling us exactly how far away it is and our speed relative to it and how long it's going to be until we get there. Obviously it's um, 99 minutes because we're not moving. Notice we can also switch between the VOR we're using so you can cross-reference. So if you were using a paper chart, you could use the nav radios cross-reference between different VOR beacons and draw lines to triangulate where you are. So if your GPS had failed, for example, you can actually figure out where you are. Um, okay, I was going to switch this out. So this is the party trick of the analog caravan. There's these knobs on the co-pilot side where you can change the kit in the in the cockpit. So I'm going to turn this from the GNS 530 to the GTN 750. And we've now got a brand new toy to play with. Yeah, and in here we can look in the flight plan. And we can see there's this is a touch screen by the way. We can see there's our um, departure, there's our VOR. So let's go and put the en route or add, add the destination. We'll come back to LFLB. LFLB. So notice how much more quick this is. You can just key things in. And it's put it in the wrong place. So we can remove that. So notice just how fast and easy this is to do things. So we could go on that and insert after LFLB. And it will go after it. Yep, and we can come back. We can go to the map. We can zoom out. We can drag the map around if we want to. Or we can recenter. So it becomes much, much nicer to use. Anyway, we're going to be using the VOR. Notice on here there's a CDI button. So we can flick that and sw switch it back between GPS and nav. There's also a button up here where you can switch this instrument regardless of that. So you could be flying using GPS but have this instrument reflect the nav radios. Does that make sense? But we're going to use VLOC mode. Okay. So th I just think the GT the GTN 750 is much, much easier and much nicer to use. If you have the paid version of it, this is the free version. If you have the paid version, you get terrain, weather, charts, all sorts of things. So that's Navigraph integration. So you could actually pull up the, the charts on there of airfields and approaches and things like that. OK. Let's just leave it on map mode. Let's get going actually get in the air and see how some of this navigation stuff works. So parking brakes off. So 
centre our view up. I just pressed F to do that. Pull that onto the wrong way. And full throttle. Well, not full throttle though. I'm only going for, if you watch the engine gauges, I'm keeping the RPM below 100 there and keeping the uh, the torque fairly low. You can actually damage the engine in the analogue caravan. So ro rotate and flaps up. It's quite a fast takeoff. We could have rotated a lot earlier. We've got no payload. So we're incredibly light. You just turn the camera around. You see there's nothing in here today. Okay, so let's get some altitude. Notice how well this aircraft climbs. And also notice that we're flying generally in the direction of that VOR station. So we can turn this to one side and it, you can see when we are going directly towards the VOR. Yeah, so I'm just going to use the trim so it will climb without me doing anything. So I'm letting go of the stick there. I need a little bit of aileron trim as well. Look, the torque of the engine is rolling the aircraft. There we go. Okay, so now I'm going to engage the autopilot. So I'm going to use a button on the stick to do it. But you could use the button here as well. Notice it's going to vertical speed and zeroing itself out. So what we need to do is set a target altitude. So it's kind of leveled the plane up. So we can see here we're at two and a half thousand feet. So we'll go for five thousand feet on the altitude. So just I just rolled this. Notice when I rolled the altitude, it said altitude is armed automatically. So then I can press the up and down keys to set the vertical speed. So a thousand feet a minute. So we go and look at that vertical speed. The aeroplane is climbing now at a thousand feet a minute. Obviously you have to know the plane to know what it's capable of climbing at and we know that a caravan can easily do a thousand feet a minute. So you can see here, are we actually going? At the moment this is just doing wing levelling. Yeah, it's not taking any notice of the radios or direction we've told it to go. So what we'll do, we'll move the heading bug to north, so we can see that is north now on the HSI and we can press heading mode on the autopilot. So the aircraft's going to turn towards the heading bug. But what if we wanted to fly towards the VOR? We can press nav mode. Now remembering that the CDI is in VOR mode, it's turning to get us onto the, the course that we have chosen to the VOR. Now we were off to the right, so it's intercepting and then it will turn right again to get us onto that 300 and, say if we said 340 degree, so the course is 340. So we basically told the aeroplane, we want to fly towards the VOR at 340 degrees. So it's indicating, or it's, it's intercepting the line. And it's almost there, look, it's going to turn, it's gently turning right now, as this centres up. And we can see that happening on the map. So if we were to draw a line from us here to the VOR, that's 340 degrees, look. So there's the 340 degree line, and we're on it. What if we actually wanted, for whatever reason, to come into this from a different angle? So if we draw a line over here, measure distance, what if we wanted to come in at 1 degree instead of 340? Well, all we need to do is change the course angle. So if we turn this round, notice we're turning the course right, but the aeroplane's going left.
Yeah, it's, this is a horrible because we're in the cloud, but this is a good indication actually of doing instrument flight for that very reason. Did I? Yeah, we're just coming up to 5,000 feet, so the plane is levelling out, look. So the vertical speed is coming back off. It's worth knowing about. But notice we actually turned left. So what's going on? So it's clever enough to know if we want to follow one degree in, it's tracking across to that uh, vector all on its own. And it will turn right again in a moment. So as soon as the course deviation indicator starts to move. So what this yellow line means is we are to the right of the track that we want to be on. Yeah, which is absolutely true. Look, there's the line. We are to the right of it. So as we get closer to it, this will sweep in. Here it comes. So obviously the plane is started gently to turn right. You can see it rolling. To, to capture the line, basically, so it's anticipating it. Notice here we have one of these is actually working, the other one isn't. It's pointing towards the VOR the entire time. So the inner one is NAV1, the outer one is NAV2, by the look of it. So NAV2 is just floating. But NAV1 is telling us the direction to the VOR from us. Okay, so you can see that's now happening. Okay, so how might we use this with um, ILS as well? So this is doing what we might call lateral navigation, just um, direction over the ground. But the ILS actually controls both the lateral and vertical navigation, so it knows your altitude. <coughs> So what we're going to do is instead of flying straight into this VOR, we're going to switch to heading mode and we're going to spin this to 90 degrees. So we're moving, just to show you here, we're moving the heading bug round to 90 degrees. We can hold shift on when we roll the mouse wheel, which makes it go a bit faster. So you can see the plane is now just following compass direction back into this valley. And we're going to tune in the nav radio to ILS, which is 109.50, and the course is 176 for the runway. 109.50 then. So we can come into here, come back out of here, and nav radios. If we go and click on the standby frequency, we can program it. So we wanted 109.50. 109.50. And tr click transfer and it becomes active immediately and you can now see we need to change the course on this to match the runway direction okay we're just flying along east it doesn't matter if we overshoot we can turn back 176 degrees we need it to be so let's go and look at the course and change it to match the runway direction so it's almost the opposite of the direction it's facing so 150 160 76 degrees ish is about there. Okay, so this is saying we're off to the right of the center line of the runway. And we just about are, but we're crossing it, look. So in a moment, we are going to cross over the center line of the runway. And we're doing it now. Yeah? But remember, we've still got distance measuring equipment running. We're 13 miles away. So what we're going to do is move the heading bug to get us back on track. We'll intercept the direction by 20 degrees. I'm just doing this kind of, you know, by ready reckoning, really. We're also going to start descending, so we're going to pull the engine back. We're going to come down now to 3,000 feet, and we're going to do it at clicking the down button a few times, uh, 1,000 feet a minute. Well, actually, we could come down steeper than that, 1,500 feet a minute. 
So you can see the vertical speed has changed. We're coming downhill and we'll pull the engine back to idle. And you'll see the needle coming in. This will be interesting to do this without looking up to prove what we're doing. Let's just have a check on here of what the altitude of the airfield is. 773 feet. So we really need about 3,500 feet then. Or 3,200, let's call it that. So if we arm that, is it going to let us? It's too close to the altitude we're at, that's the problem. So let, yeah, there we go. So we'll say, If we just press the ALT button, it will hold us where we are, which was 3,300 feet, so you can see vertical speed has leveled down. So did you notice there? <laughs> Look at that, that's funny. So we're just going to graze the trees. This is why you have to be aware. So I'm going to pull up just to miss the trees. So I disengage the autopilot there. re-engage the autopilot. It's trying still to get us to 3,300 but it's doing it incorrectly so I'm going to dis disengage it. So let's go, we haven't actually armed. So let's go altitude, we want to get to 3,000 feet, arm that and to get there, we're at 3,000 now, look, so we can press ALT just to do altitude hold. And you'll see the vertical speed will come back down towards zero. Right, so where are we in terms of that centre line? We are off to the right. So there's a magic button here. We could either do this by heading or we can press approach mode. Because we've got the glide slope and we've got the localizer. So I've pressed Approach, and what it's going to do is get us into the right place. It will continue to intercept the beam. So you can see that happening. Look, it's intercepting the ILS beam. But it's also going to do it vertically. So you can see at the moment, it's levelling the plane out. Yeah, so it's making the turns and going for zero on the vertical speed. But you see this extra marker here for the glide slope. That is our position either above or below an invisible line down to the runway. So if you imagine this is a line in the sky and it gets higher and higher obviously the further away you are because it follows a three degree line down to the ground. At the moment we are below. So this, this marker being here means we are below the line. When it comes down, when it gets to the middle, we will be on that three degree line towards the ground. Yeah. So we are pretty much on the runway centre line. There's a very small crosswind, which you can see it's having to crab across, but it's fishtailing a little bit to, to get it on there. When we get a bit closer though, let's have a look at distance measuring. We're five and a bit miles out. So this will begin to fall. Actually, that's a good point. Let's go and see what angle this is at. Oh, it's four and a half degrees, not three degrees. So it's quite a steep one. Oh, the reason I realised that is because we're getting quite close and this hadn't started moving down yet. It's because it's a steep approach. So we're doing 90 knots, which is fine. I'm going to slow down a little bit. I'm going to start extending flaps. And here comes the glide slope. So when the glide slope gets to the middle, the plane will start descending. At the moment, it's correcting for the flaps. So it's trying to get back to our target altitude. Yeah, so it's going for the two and a half thousand feet. And here we go. So watch it descend. There it goes. 
So the plane is now flying down towards the runway all on its own. We're three and a half miles out. We are on the centre line. We are on the glide slope. We are getting closer and closer. We've got the speed under control. Obviously, as you start descending, the plane will start to accelerate. So we're pulling the throttle back to manage speed. So this is the bit where we can do the magic trick. And if we look up, we should see we are right in line with the runway. OK, so we're two and a half miles out. So let's look up. And there's the runway. So obviously the, the real point of using the instruments to fly like this is you could land when you can't see the runway. So I'm going to come back off the autopilot because that's no fun, is it? And we're going to fly it manually. And so we can show what happens with these needles. So if I go left, we go to the left of the center line. Yeah, so you'll see the needles swipe, swipe right. So we're to the left of where we should be. If we go to the right, you can see we're going to the right of the center line absolutely corroborates. At the moment we're on the glide slope, so if we pull the nose up, slowing down as we do so, notice the glide slope has fallen away, we are above the line. So if we dive back towards it and then pull up, we can judge by looking at the movement of the glide slope marker of where we should be. So the whole point of this is you can approach without being able to see anything. You're just looking at the attitude indicator and the instruments and the speed and you can judge your approach pretty finely. Okay, so we'll just come in, the engine's on idle. We could go for more flaps. So I'm going for full flaps and you can see the speed bleeding off now. So obviously as we pull over the runway, centre line, we'll run out of speed and the aeroplane will just gently fall to the floor all on its own. Okay, so this ended up being kind of m more about navigation than anything, but that's what most of these gauges are for. The only other ones to keep note of are the torque, really. Um, fuel flow obviously is going to influence how quickly you're burning fuel, but the torque is the important one, because if we just hold this on the brakes for a moment, I'm going to put the parking brake on, I'm going to run the engine up. Let me show damage before we, before we do this. So I'm showing engine condition, which is at 96%. OK, I'm going to run the engine up. And I'm going to push it beyond where I should. OK, ready? So watch the engine condition percentage. Ready? I'm going to push it that last bit. Watch that percentage number. 95, 94, 93. So we are really, I mean, the engine is being absolutely thrashed and it's, it's damaging the cylinders. Well, if it was a combustion engine, it would be damaging the cylinders. In this, it's just damaging, you know, the, the moving parts of the engine are being pushed beyond limits. So we've actually done quite a lot of damage to the engine in those few seconds. So that's why you have to be careful with the engine in an accurate rendition of the caravan. OK, let's go and get off the runway. Notice the turning circle on the caravan is absolutely fantastic. Oh, it's stuttering really badly. Obviously trying to load scenery. Obviously we would have talked to air traffic control to get approval to do what we just did. So we're going to go and park up and shut the plane back down, which shouldn't take long at all. So coming off the runway, you would normally go and turn the strobes back off. You turn your landing lights back off and leave the taxi light on.
Let's use some of the park. We'll put in between the um, the Kodiak and the RV14 over here, I guess. Okay, parking brake on. So, easiest way to shut the engine down is to pull the fuel condition lever back and then cut the RPM as well which will feather the propeller as well obviously you're going to get annunciation lights coming on because it's got low pressure so you do things in reverse order from here basically so you can turn the avionics back off you can turn the fuel pump back to off you can turn the battery now to off, but you want to go and turn all the electrics off first before you do that. So seatbelt signs come off, smoking sign off, pitot heat off. If you've got any lights on, you turn them off at this point and then turn the battery off. And overhead, you finally go and shut the fuel valves back off and you're good to go. So yeah, there we go. It's the C208 Grand Caravan and you saw we had two different setups here. There's actually another one so you can flick that out and see a much more basic setup with uh, a GPS that doesn't have a map on it which still works the same. You know you can do flight planning in exactly the same way but you have to play games with maybe choosing the, the leg that you want rather than being able to visually see it. So hopefully that was instructive. I wasn't following real world procedures to the letter but you know it's good enough for a simulator to be able to see functionally what you do in what order. Okay, there we go. So I'm going to leave it there and I'll see you again soon.